So King David let his hormones get away with him. Spying and undressed Bathsheba as she was taking her bath, he on the roof of his palace, he desired her, sent for her, and took her to his bed. And then matters got even worse. She became pregnant. His fault. He attempted to deceive her husband and then maneuvered him into a place of danger so that he was killed in battle. And then later brought Bathsheba to his palace to be one of his wives. Second Samuel 11, which recounts this story, ends with these words. But the Lord was displeased with what David had done. That's an oops. That is serious. So, it goes on, the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David with a story. Nathan said there were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious when he heard this. He said, as surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one that he stole and had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord God of Israel says, why have you despised the word of the, of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite and stolen his wife. God then pronounced the penalties that David would bear for his rash act. David repented and sought forgiveness. You can read the whole story in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, and David's later reflections on that whole incident in Psalm 51. Nathan's parable to David is a perfect example of how effective a parable can be. Nathan's words to David were an alert, not of simple accusation, but of how deeply David had transgressed. Had Nathan gone to David the king, who had all power, and, and just hit him with a bald accusation, he would have received defensiveness at best and death at worst. But the simple story of the lamb put the matter into David's heart so that he could see how terribly he had erred. Nathan's short story was a parable. Beginning next Sunday, as, as you know, Pastor Doug will take us through a series of many of the parables of Jesus. My purpose today is to briefly explain this literary device. I'm going to be a little, a little academic today and, uh, and, and show how Jesus raised this to an art form. The parables of Jesus were so effective that they continue to open our hearts today. And even unbelievers today know of the, of, of the prodigal son and of the good Samaritan and a poor man, Lazarus. So bear with me for a few minutes as I assume the role of professor and explain some background concerning parables. You're more awake than you were last week. I don't know what was going on then. Here we go. We begin with a simple definition. I like uh, Gerhard Kittel's definition best. It's a little wordy, though. It says, a New Testament parable is an ind independent similitude in which an evident and accepted truth from a known field like nature or human life is designed to establish and illustrate a new truth in the preaching and teaching of Jesus. Get all that? <laughs> or, more simply, parables are an effective teaching tool. They use a story or a comparison to make a point. They are almost invariably in the past tense or present. And so there, some of them are very simple. The kingdom of God is like. It's like a pearl of great price. The kingdom of God is like a treasure that's in a field. And then you go on to the narrative parables, which are stories in which people speak, and there's a character, and a, a whole story plays out. Example of that is the story of a, of a family, one of whom was a, an intemperate son who was very rash, resulting in the story in a display of the father's prodigious love, mercy, and forgiveness, 
We are the Son. God is the Father. No matter what, he wants us to come home. The parables of Jesus were vivid and they were dramatic. He was a master storyteller. The Jews of of Jesus' time were used to parables because they were a rabbinic teaching tool. The rabbis, however, used parables to clarify a point of law, of the Mosaic law. The parables uh, from them were dry legalese, while Jesus' parables were full of vitality and originality and riveted the hearer. Jesus was not trying to prove points of law. He was illustrating the king of the kingdom of God, and he was illustrating the life of the citizens of the kingdom of God. He was breathing life and excitement into the the life of faith and hope. His proclamation was the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Do you remember what I said about repent last week? When do you start repentance? Right now? It's in the aorist tense in Greek. So uh, aorist means continuing action from a certain point. And so when Jesus said repent, he was really saying repent right now. Get your act together right here and don't stop. Do it for the whole rest of your entire life. You are always in the process of becoming more and more like the children of God. And believe, he said, believe. Do it now. But you have no idea of the depth of your belief that is going to come. So keep on believing. Keep on pursuing. And that is exactly what happened with his disciples and the later church that was to come. So he used the parables to help his hearers understand how radical and how wonderful this kingdom of God was and is. Remember how we defined the parable of God in last week's sermon? This is audience participation. You can nod. You can shake your head. Come on. Okay, in your bulletin is a little sheet of paper that has the definition of the kingdom of God on it. Pull it out. You see that? Thank you. Just look at that. I'm going to read it from here. Go down to where it says and starts, the kingdom of God is the complete. The kingdom of God is the complete, unbounded rule of God in our hearts, minds, and actions. It is a chosen rule. We choose to make him the CEO, the CFO, and the COO of our whole and entire life. That means that when we get up in the morning and we say to God, thank you for this brand new day. Thank you for the gift. And when we say to him in our early morning prayer, I am yours today. I give myself to you. I do it without reservation. I withhold nothing from you. I am yours today. Do with me as you will. That in that instant, we are taking to ourselves the kingdom of God. And we are taking to ourselves the rule of God in our heart and in our life and in our actions in that day. But what does that mean? And what does that look like? So the parables of Jesus are the illustrations of that kingdom. And so certain themes emerge as the parables are told. Uh, The kingdom of God has a special concern for the oppressed and for the poor. The faith that we feel on the inside must be expressed in actions of mercy, uh, in actions, no, did I, where did I go? My notes just went away. Have any of you reached the point where um, you know you're going to say something really terrific in just a minute, and so you take a breath, and it's gone? <laughs> I, some of you have, I can tell. So, so with the parables, singleness of devotion is stressed. Repentance is required, for you cannot serve both God and mammon. The faith we feel on the inside must be expressed in acts of mercy and love, and so the Good Samaritan shows us the way. The kingdom will be fulfilled when we least expect the return of Jesus, so be as ready as a bride for the bridegroom. The person who finds security in earthly goods is a fool, so invest in God's kingdom before filling your own barns. And all these images help teach us the character and the quality of the kingdom of God. And Jesus told a great story about God's nature and about his actions. He said he's kind. He's like a good father who gives only good gifts to his children. He rejoices at the recovery of a lost sinner, and so he's like a great good shepherd. It says that he welcomes and receives a sinner who returns to him repentant like a father would welcome his prodigal son home. He says that a man who repents and finds forgiveness, who repents, 
finds forgiveness, while the self-righteous go away empty, like the Pharisee who was so full of himself that when he prayed to God, he basically just told God how, how really fortunate God was to have him on his side, as opposed to the publican who wouldn't even go into the temple courts, but stood outside and lifted his hands and said, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so he grabs our attention with these parables. He says God is so generous that he will give equal shares of his kingdom uh, to everyone, uh, to those who have labored in that kingdom for all of their life, and even to those who just came into it, they all get this equal share because he is great and wonderful. And several parables deal with the nature and the duty of people as citizens of the kingdom of God. And so we must examine ourselves and count the cost if we are to decide for the kingdom like a man building a tower. We're to shine out for the kingdom like a city which is built on a hill for all to see. We are to be overcome with gratitude for the forgiveness of God like a person who's been forgiven a huge, tremendous debt. And we're like trees. We'll be known for our fruit. And the love of neighbor requires that God uh, sets no limits for us and, and that our love cannot have limits either. And again, the Good Samaritan stands as the example. The parables of Jesus are like a huge picture window, a huge picture window showing us the greatness of God's kingdom, the greatness of our God, and the greatness of the life that he calls us to. The parables of the kingdom still live for us because he used the stuff of real life. He talked about family, about business relationships and business practices. He talked about weddings and feasts and agriculture and politics. All of that to teach us about this wonderful kingdom of God that we get to choose to be a part of. So as the pictures of the kingdom of God, parables have some unique advantages. First, they make truth concrete. They're not academic. They're not abstract truth. They help us think in pictures. I mean, you, you think in pictures, don't you? You realize that? We like to visualize what we are thinking about. And so in our relationship with God and his kingdom, every great truth must become flesh. Every great idea must take form and shape in a person. The first and greatest quality of a parable is that it makes truths concrete and understandable. Parables are a great way to get from here and now to there and then. Parables begin with things we can understand now and progress to things we may not have known or considered before. They open the eyes. Parables induce the listener to discover the truth for his or her own self. They don't do the hearer's thinking for them. So let me talk about a parable. Matthew, in Matthew 13, we have the parable of the, uh, of the mustard seed. Listen to this simple parable. Matthew 13, by the way, is full of parables. The entire chapter is either parables being told or explained. And in there, Jesus said, starting with verse 31, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. Jesus also used this illustration. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast, a woman. How many of you make bread? You make bread, Mickey? Cool. Yeah. I make bread, and I really, the most critical part is the yeast and how that is put into the bread and taken care of. Uh, where was I? I got lost in bread. I just love the aroma of bread. I mean, it's in the oven, and I almost can't wait for it to come out. And then it comes out, and you can't eat it yet, or else it'll all just turn to mush when you try to cut it. Just That's the most difficult part. You did not need to know that. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman uses in making bread, even though she puts in only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeates every part of the dough. Matthew goes on to say, Jesus always used stories and illustrations like these when speaking to the crowds. And in fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. Of this parable, first, context. When studying parables, always examine the context first. When Jesus told this parable, he was in Galilee. 
He's been going from village to village with his disciples. They've been proclaiming the kingdom of God. They've been going into the synagogues. They've been standing on a mountainside. They've been standing in fields in a variety of settings, proclaiming the kingdom of God and healing and teaching. On the day he told this particular parable, he was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Crowds had been drawing close all day. He started the day teaching in a house. Uh, but it grew too crowded, and so he relocated to uh, the uh, shore of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. And from there, the crowd continued to grow and kept pressing on him. And so he got in a boat, and he had it pushed out just a little bit. And from the boat, he continued to address the crowd. The day had some tension of its own. While he was still in the house in the morning, his mother and his four brothers and his sisters came to see him. In his gospel, uh, Peter, uh, we believe that Peter wrote the gospel of Mark. Mark was his scribe. In his gospel, Peter says they came to take him away, saying he is out of his mind. And so the day kind of began with that. Opposition to him has been growing. The disputes are increasing. Institutionalized Jewish leaders have labeled him. They call him a blasphemer, an agent of the devil, a lawbreaker. And they dispute with him and challenge his words and his actions. Confusion about him has been growing. A few days just before the telling of this parable, the disciples of John the Baptist, who by this time was in prison, came to him and they, they asked him, and they said, are, are you the Messiah we've been ex- expecting? Or should, we, or should we keep looking for somebody else? Because he was confusing them. And Jesus' response to them was a restatement of the passage from Isaiah 61 that he read in the synagogue a few, a few days before that. He told John's disciples, go back and tell John what you have heard and what you have seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, the good news is preached to the poor. There was confusion. Jesus had asserted that the kingdom had begun, but when when the people said, where, where is it? The results looked meager. He drew crowds, yeah. He had begun a healing ministry, yes. He had drawn a band of disciples, but at this point, only 12 of them could be called his men. They had no home base of operations, no steady flow of income. They were still largely ignored by the leaders and the priests and the authorities as an irritating sideshow. The ignition point of his ministry was still yet to come on that future cross when it would absolutely ignite and inflame the society and the the disciples of that time. So that's the context. Into this context, look at the parable of the mustard seed. It's like he was saying, yes, the the greatness of God's kingdom and the greatness of what we're doing now is small, but baby, just wait till you see what's going to happen next. They had no idea of the power of the coming resurrection. They could not even conceive of the kingdom of God going to the Gentiles. They could not even imagine that the kingdom of God would spread to the entire world. There was no powerful church for them to point to. A church that grew as a persecuted faith from the time of the the death of John, the last apostle. It was about 25,000 Christians at that time in the world. By the time of Constantine, who legitimized the Christian faith, by that time it had grown from 25,000 to 25 million in the Roman Empire. Even Christians today seem to be unaware of the continuing power and the continuing spread of the kingdom of God. Do you know that as churches continue to decline in the West that there are now more Christian churches in India than there are in the United States? Did you know that? Come on, audience participation. There are. That the fastest growing church movements today are in India and in China? Just think about China. When Chairman Mao uh, uh, closed down the West, closed down uh, his kingdom to the West in 1949, he threw out all the Christian missionaries and pulled down the bamboo curtain. There were about 60,000 Christians in China at that time. And Mao uh, instituted a severe, severe persecution of Christians throughout his reign. When Mao died and China finally reached the point where Westerners were again able to come back in, missionaries who had worked in China for all those earlier years went to see if any of their believers had survived and if the church was still there. They found that the kingdom of God had flourished 
and that the 60,000 had become 60 million. Did you know that? By the time of the Olympics that happened in China this uh, past two years ago, Christianity is the largest and the greatest of the faiths. That was stated in the international news. The kingdom of God continues to advance powerfully in Asia and South Africa and South America and in Africa and in Latin America. It's changing whole and entire cultures and people groups as it grows. Indeed, it's like a mustard seed, which starts small. But baby, give that some water, give that some fertilizer, and it's going to grow and it's going to become powerful in a place where people can find refuge and can build their homes and can build their hope. This growth is carried by individuals. Martin Luther refused to recant when he called the Roman Catholic Church to task for its perversions. And a whole wave of new faith and devotion swept through Europe. The Wesley brothers, John and Charles, led a powerful revival in, uh, in, Great, in, in Great Britain. And countless missionaries have been used by God to bring entire cultures to Christ. I'll never forget uh, one of the men that I went to college with at Northwest Christian College. Uh, he became a missionary. He was working in Asia. And I can't even remember where, but I do remember that when he came home for his first furlough, he was absolutely aglow. And he said that wherever it was that he was working, that the word of God and that the kingdom of God was so powerful that he didn't even have to go out into the villages to preach. They were sending their leaders to him, and they were saying, teach us about this Christ and about this God. Our whole village is ready to become Christians. And he would go, and his job was just baptize them and get them going. And then on they went. The kingdom of God is powerful. It is growing and it will never stop and never cease. It is by its nature transformative, transforming nations and peoples and individuals. How am I going to conclude this? <sighs> Doug's going to have to do that. As he talks about the individual parables. You must make your own application. The kingdom of God is a huge sea of opportunities and of, of possibilities. Choose the way that you will take to stand for God and work for others to create a reality. I want you to listen to this. To create a reality where the followers of Jesus are valued for their generosity and service to their communities, demonstrating God's love and faith in ways that transform neighbors, Neighborhoods equip ordinary people to become his heroes and draw new people into his mission. For you, above all, above all things, a citizen of the kingdom of God, you are a part of this mighty and eternal God. Is that enough? I want you to go home and I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the things that you're doing in your life that help show that the kingdom of God lives in you. The people you talk to, perhaps in your workplace, are you a volunteer in any nonprofit that helps other people and helps the disadvantaged? It's really easy to become one, and we need volunteers. Are you one of those people who gives food to food banks? That's a wonderful thing to do. Are you a person who goes and works like with Catalyst and, and helps people's homes when they can't help themselves. It's a wonderful thing to do, but look at your own individual life. What are you doing? How is the kingdom of God manifest in your life? Think about it.